Let us pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this new Sabbath and this opportunity that we have to come apart from the cares of this life and to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, as we pause for a few moments in your presence today, we pray that you would speak to us. May you take the words of Scripture and apply them to our hearts. We need the Holy Spirit this morning, and we thank you for the gift that you've promised to those that ask. For we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> On the uh, screen, I have a drawing of Henry Martin. He was a Cambridge scholar that lived in the late 1700s and into the 1800s. He was a genius, and they say that his physical appearance was quite appalling. He had warts covering his face and his hands, and at public events like cricket games, he would many times be on the outskirts just watching from a distance because of his appearance. There was a young lady by the name of Lydia that fell in love with Henry Martin because of the mind that he had and the gentleman that he was. And one day Henry Martin was sitting in a church service and he heard a missionary tell of India and of the needs that were there. And Henry Martin says that a fire burned in his heart for India to be a missionary. And so he ran to Lydia and told Lydia about the, the burden for India that he had. And he said, let's get married and go to India. And Lydia said, there's one place in the world I never want to go, and that's India. And he said, how can you say that? She said, well, I'm sorry, that's the way I feel. And so Henry Martin went back to his room, and he was in turmoil. Would it be Lydia or India? Lydia or India, and finally he realized it wasn't between Lydia and India, it was between Lydia and God. So he decided that he would go to India, and while he's making the preparations, one of his professors at Cambridge told him, Henry, you have a brilliant mind, you have a brilliant career ahead of you, don't throw it away. And Henry said, which world are you speaking of, sir? So Henry went to India, and when he arrived there, one of the quotes that he said was, Lord, let me burn out for God. He was dragged across the desert in chains when he went to Persia, and he died at the age of 31. 31. Uh, many people would say, what a waste of a life, but before he died, he translated the Bible into three different languages. Persian, Hindustani, and one other language. And when we hear stories like Henry Martin, there's a certain part of me that, that just marvels at the, at the dedication and the sacrifice of individuals that gave everything in their service for the Lord Jesus. And sitting in my comfortable home here in Anchorage, Alaska, um, it's quite a challenge sometimes when I think of the disparity between Christianity today and Christianity in the first century or even in the 17th or 18th century. And we have missionaries today as well. I finished a book a few weeks ago. It's, it was entitled, or it is entitled, The Forgotten Ways by Alan Hirsch, uh, an evangelical, and he does a fascinating assessment of what first century Christianity was like and does a, a painful assessment of where Christianity is today. And this is a quotation from Alan Hirsch, an evangelical scholar. He said, I came to the conclusion that there must be something about middle class culture that seems to run contrary to authentic gospel values. And this is not to make a statement about middle-class people, per se. I, myself, am from a very middle-class family, family, but rather to isolate some of the values and assumptions that seem to come along as part of the deal. We need to be especially aware of cultural values that we take for granted because we cannot easily see them. 
I noted earlier that much of what goes by the name middle class involves a preoccupation with safety and security, developed mostly in pursuit of what seems to be best for our children. This focus is understandably is understandable as long as it does not become obsessive. But when these impulses of middle class culture fuse with consumerism, as they most often do, we can add the obsession with comfort and convenience to the list. This is not a good mix, at least as far as the lordship of Jesus, discipleship, the gospel, and missional movements are concerned. This was challenging for me to re read because I come from a middle class family and it is the middle class that has built America. And there's nothing wrong with being middle class, but what he's simply saying is that there are certain things that we imbibe being in a certain culture, in American culture, being middle class, that we are not always conscious of. And sometimes we can confuse these values as being central to Christianity. And he brings up these three elements of consumerism, comfort, and convenience. Now, there's nothing wrong inherently with comfort and convenience. There's challenges with consumerism. But sometimes following Jesus can make us uncomfortable. Amen? It can cause us inconvenience, inconvenient death and discomfort. And we are living in a time and a culture where Christianity has fused so much with the culture around us that it is sometimes very difficult to distinguish between what is Christian and what is culture. I look at this statement by Jesus in Luke chapter 14, verse 33. This is a radical statement from Jesus in the first century. He says, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. This is a radical statement, and it is challenging because you look at all of the disciples, they gave up everything to follow Jesus. James and John left their boats. Matthew left a lucrative career, and you remember what Jesus said to the rich young ruler? He said, go and sell everything that you have, and then follow me. So you can see that Christianity in the first century is required radical dedication, radical commitment. And this is not to say that we are to go out right now and sell everything, but what I believe the Bible is calling us to be and to do is to hold on to our possessions and our livelihoods lightly. Amen? and that they not be central to all our existence. And if the Lord does call us to radical sacrifice, to give these things up, that we be willing to follow Jesus wherever he may lead. And I've had a personal reflection about how consumerism has affected me as a pastor. You know, you get into these things, and I have a hobby in photography. I shared a, a few a sermons ago, and it seems like there's always a new camera coming out that makes mine look dull and less megapixels and doesn't have the same ISO, and, and you're always longing for the newest thing and the latest gadget, and you get into this consumerism rut. And the realization sinks over me that Christianity and consumerism are very far apart from one another. They are antithetical to the gospel message. So how do we process this concept of radical commitment found in the gospels? And we're in our series on the sanctuary, and today we're focusing on the brazen altar. It's the first article of furniture that you come to in the sanctuary. There were different sacrifices that were um, on the brazen altar, you had the sin offering, uh, you had the trespass offering, but there was one sacrifice that went back all the way to Genesis. It's the most prevalent sacrifice in Scripture in the Old Testament, and it is the burnt offering. 
The burnt offering was quite different than the other offerings. The other offerings, many times the priest or the person bringing the offering would get a portion of that offering. It was to be a part of what the priest received and a part of their food allotment in some of the different offerings. But the burnt offering was different. The burnt offering, you took the animal and you consumed the entire animal on the altar. The priest didn't get any of it. The person bringing the offering did not get any of it either. And uh, if you have your study guides, you can follow along. This text is in your study guide. This is the first sacrifice that's recorded in Leviticus chapter 1. And, uh, you know, when you try to read the Bible through, you get through Genesis very good. You get through Exodus usually. And then when you get to Leviticus, you're like, hmm, this is challenging. All these sacrifices, well, what all do they mean? And this is the first sacrifice that is described in Leviticus 1. And let's read it in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Then the priest, Aaron's son, shall lay the part the parts of the animal that, they've, that has been killed, uh, the parts of the head, the fat, in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar, but he shall wash its entrails and legs with water, and the priest shall burn, how much of it? All on the altar as a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. So this animal is is to be placed on the altar, it's to be washed, and all of it is to be burned on the altar. Now, from a certain standpoint, you think to yourself, like, what a waste. I mean, you mean no one gets to eat any of it? It's just consumed, not even the priest? The entire altar is, uh, the entire animal is placed on the altar, and it's just burned up. And, and notice the response that God has to this offering. To God, it is a sweet aroma to the Lord. In other words, to God, this is like, it's pleasing. He's like, thank you. I mean, what does this mean? Uh, there's another text in your study guide in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 12 through 13. It, it repeats this same process describing it, and this is for emphasis. And he shall cut it in pieces with its head and its fat, and the priest shall lay them on, in order on the wood that is on the fire upon the altar, and he shall wash the entrails and the legs with water. Then the priest shall bring it all and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. What does this sacrifice mean? In reflection, what was actually happening was that that animal represented the person bringing the animal. And when the animal was laid on the altar, symbolically, the person was saying, I am giving all of me to God, unreservedly. It, it was a, a vicarious way of, of giving surrender. So you bring a perfectly good animal to the sanctuary and you take the entire animal, it's consumed on the altar, and by, by this offering, you are saying, Lord, I give you everything I am, unreservedly. And to God, he says, like, that's the most awesome thing you could ever do. It is sweet to God. Um, one scholar in reflection says that the parts of the animal that are placed on the altar represent us, and these are the parts. The head represents the mind and the intellect. The inwards represent the will and the emotions. The legs indicate the walk, which represents the conduct and the lifestyle and the fat represents the health and the virility. Remember what Jesus said, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. Now to be clear, um, this was not payment. This is not a person saying, look, I give all of me because this is what it requires in the transaction of salvation, and, and this is my payment to God so that I can earn salvation, but this is purely relational, purely relational. This was not a forced offering. This was voluntary, and a person being so touched by the mercies of God would say, Lord, 
Because of what you've done for me, I give you all of me. The most intimate relationship we can have this side of heaven with human beings is marriage. Marriage is a radical thing. When you say yes to that person, you're saying no to a billion other people or billions of other people uh, in the same breath. And you are fusing your life together. You're giving all of yourself to that individual. And no one goes to a wedding. Well, most people don't say, what a tragic thing. Terrible. Total commitment. I mean, you're giving all of yourself to each other. Oh, give me a handkerchief. I'm going to just weep and mourn because of this radical commitment. No, there are tears of joy at weddings because there is that total giving of yourself to the other person. Ideally speaking, of course, the way that marriage was intended to be, and that's what makes marriage so beautiful. And so in the relational aspect with God, when a person is so touched by the love of God, notice the response of the person voluntarily saying, Lord, I give you all. I give you all unreservedly to God. This is from the book, The Sanctuary Service, page 90. The offerer placed himself symbolically on the altar, his entire life wholly devoted to God, and the burnt offering signified all that I, what does it say? All that I am is Christ. Total surrender. All that I am is Christ. The relational response to the love of God is saying, Lord, I give you all, signified by the burnt offering. Now, there was another offering that was given. Um, before we go to that, um, Romans 12, verse 1. Uh, this is also a New Testament principle as well. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So this idea of giving ourselves to God as a living sacrifice is also a New Testament principle as well. And this is that relational response to God. And notice he says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God. In other words, this is our response because of the mercies of God that we say, Lord, I give myself as a living sacrifice. There was another offering that was mentioned in Scripture. Um, this is actually from Leviticus chapter 2. And this is known as the grain or the food offering. So Leviticus chapter 1 is the burnt offering. Leviticus chapter 2 is the grain or the food offering. And this is Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. When anyone brings a grain offering to the Lord, their offering is to be of the finest flour. They are to pour olive oil on it, put incense on it, and take it to Aaron's son, the priest. The priest shall take a handful of the flour and oil together with the incense and burn it as a memorial portion on the altar, a food offering, an aroma pleasing to the Lord, the rest of the grain offering belongs to Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the food offering presented to the Lord. Now, the, the priest got a portion of this offering. Uh, and notice that the same phrase is used, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. Now, many times the burnt offering was given together with the food offering. They were combined. And this is one way of looking at it, according to Dr. Leslie Harding. He says, by his burnt offering, the worshiper affirmed all that I am is Christ, and then on the basis of this dedication, further declared through his meal offering, all that I have is Christ. So the, the response to God's love is all that I am and all that I have. All of my possessions belong to God as well. This is signifying total surrender to God in the relational response to what He has done. All that I am, all that I have belongs to God. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus uses the term uh, or the word all. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all of your mind. In 
our relationships, especially our most intimate relationships, we treasure this idea of 100% total commitment to each other. This is from Jim Elliott, the missionary that died in South America at a very early age, ministering to a a population there that had been unreached. And notice what he said in his journal. Father, let me be weak that I might loose my clutch on everything temporal. My life, my reputation, my possessions. Lord, let me loose the tension of the grasping hand. How often I have released a grasp only to retain what I have prized, releasing all that I may be released. So let me release my grasp. I think we can relate to this. All of us have different things that we hold on to, don't we? Um, Things that are easier to surrender than others. And uh, in my own personal reflection, there are certain things I just hold on to because we, we like to be in control and we don't want to surrender this area of our life and whatever it may be. And I think of Clifford Goldstein's story in his book, The Best Seller. There's actually a video testimony that he gives of his experience. He was an aspiring writer. and He said his senior year in college, he started writing a novel and this novel was his life. He said all of his other friends were getting degrees, but he was just consumed with this novel. And this is from his testimony. He said, one night the Lord came to me and just said to me, you've been playing with me long enough. If you want me tonight, burn the novel. And in that instant, the Lord showed me that the novel was my God. And nothing else in the world meant more to me than that book. That book was everything to me. But then it's fascinating because I had all this back and forth and then finally at one point I surrendered. I said, okay God, I want you, I want truth more than I want this novel. And once I made that choice, I made that surrender, all the turmoil and all the struggle, everything lifted. And he talks about how he took that novel and his mom had gotten him one of those burner stoves and he put the novel on the burner and just turned it on, went to ashes and he swept it out his front door. And he says in his testimony, I've never been sorry. My life radically, radically changed and that was the night I became a born again believer. There's something liberating about total surrender. And when you give of yourself to God, you say, Lord, I want you, um, you realize that those idols actually possessed us more than we possess them. And there's a liberating element that comes in. I have a f- few quotes I want to share with you about surrender. These are my favorite quotes, and I refer to these often. And I want to encourage you, um, if these are a blessing to you, to refer to them as well. This is from the book Christ Object Lessons, and I have these in your study guide so that you can uh, refer to them. Uh, because I many times assumed in my Christian experience that surrender was something that I had to just get up the gumption and fabricate and do. Um, But the reality is we can't even surrender. And uh, this is from Christ Object Lessons, page 159. No outward observances can take the place of simple faith and entire renunciation of self. Listen to this. No man can empty himself of self. In other words, we can't even surrender on our own. We can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure and holy atmosphere where the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. We can't even give ourselves to God. 
We can only say, Lord, I need help. I need help. That consent is the most powerful thing. Um, the second quote that I refer to often in my Christian experience, Steps of Christ, page 47. Many are inquiring, how am I to make the surrender of myself to God? You desire to give yourself to him, but you are weak in moral power, in slavery to doubt, and controlled by the habits of your life of sin. Your promises and resolutions are like ropes of sand. You cannot control your thoughts, your impulses, your affections. What you need to understand is the true force of the will. This is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or of choice. Everything depends on the right action of the will. The power of choice God has given to men, it is theirs to exercise. You cannot change your heart. You cannot of yourself give to God its affections, but you can choose to serve him. You can give him your will. Thus your whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. In other words, we can't surrender. We need help to surrender. Um, last quote I want to share with you in regards to surrender. This is from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 142. Beautiful quote. I've referenced this before. The will must be placed on the side of God's will. You are not able of yourself to bring your purposes and desires and inclinations into submission to the will of God, but if you are willing to be made willing, God will accomplish the work for you. How do we surrender? Well, we can't surrender, but you can go to God and say, Lord, I have this thing I'm holding on to in my life. Uh, I love it. I don't want to give it up. Help me to want to surrender. Um, there are so many times that I prayed to God and I've said, Lord, um, I don't want to give this thing up. I enjoy it too much. Change my heart, O oh God. Help me to desire to desire. And this is the, the way that surrender works is surrender is not something that we just conjure up and say, Lord, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do this thing, pull yourself by your own bootstraps. Surrender is, is really saying to God and saying, Lord, this is who I am. These are the things that are weighing me down. And Lord, I need help. I need help because I don't even want to give this up. I don't even want to change. But help me to want to change. And this is the ground from which it works. Um, so many times I feel like uh, I can be kind of insincere in my prayers and come to him and kind of be fakey, but you can come to God and say, Lord, this is who I am. Change my heart. Change my desires. Help me to give this up for you. And it's a beautiful thing because God, that's all he wants is that window, is that consent, is that permission and he will work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. What is the area that God is calling you to surrender today? What is the area that you're holding on to very closely? And the reality is we are never more happier and free as to when we let the Lord release our grasp of these areas in our lives. Um, the question comes, this is in your study guide, how often am I to surrender? Is it once surrendered, always surrendered? The reality is, uh, this is a daily thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31, I die daily, every day. Get up and say, Lord, help me willing to be made willing. I surrender my life to you. This would be a daily prayer. It should be your first prayer that you pray in the morning, saying, Lord, I want to consecrate my life to you. Um, again, Christ Object Lessons, page 159, it is not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. At every advanced step heavenward, it is to be renewed. All of our good works are dependent on a power outside of ourselves. Therefore, there needs to be a continual reaching out of the heart after God, a continual earnest heartbreaking confession of sin, and humbling of the soul before him. 
only by daily renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. So every day in your prayer time to say, Lord, I want to give my heart to you. Take my heart because I can't give it. I want to be willing to be made willing. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Our last text there in your study guide, I referred to it earlier, but there's a couple words that I emphasized on the screen. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Has God been merciful to you today? Has he been merciful to you in your Christian experience? Has he been very forbearing and forgiving of our mistakes? He has. I mean, I would have given up on myself a long time ago, but praise the Lord, his mercies are new every morning. He, does, he never gives up on us. And so Paul has just spent 11 chapters expounding on the mercies of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the forbearance of God. And then after he has just spent 11 chapters, he says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, based on what God has done for you, that in response to the relational love that God has given, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. And he says, by the way, this is reasonable. This is reasonable. In light of everything that God has done for us, our response is, Lord, I give you all. All that I am, all that I have, I give to the Lord. And let us stand as we sing our closing hymn. Um, and may this be our prayer this morning as we reflect on the mercies of God. Uh, I pray that this is my response to him. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. May this be our offering to God for what he has done. All to Jesus, I surrender. Let us pray. Father in heaven, that is the plea and the prayer of our hearts, that in response to the love of God and our experience of gratefulness to you, that we would give all that we are and all that we have joyfully to you in response. And Lord, I'm wondering if there's someone here today and someone here today that's been hanging on and has not made that total surrender and wants to say to Jesus, Lord, help me to let go. Help me to be willing to be made willing. And if there's someone here today with every head bowed and eyes closed that just wants to, to raise their hands and say, Lord, help me willing to be made willing today. God knows your heart. He sees your hands, and I pray today that through your spirit that you would see the consent that each soul that has raised their hands today has given. And we believe, Lord, that you can change our hearts, that you can strengthen us, that you can empower us through the Holy Spirit. We thank you for this gift and this promise. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.